Today on Real Life, does America have amnesia? Author Jerry Newcomb focuses our national attention back to Christ. Plus, James Gall explains the keys to developing spiritual discernment. And feeling the love of Christmas with a special tribute to B.E. Taylor. The late singer's son shares about how the concerts will honor his legacy. That's today on Real Life. Hello and welcome to Real Life, a place where both believers and seekers can come together and we're going to praise God, we're going to pray to God for direction, we're going to learn from His Word, and we're going to encourage one another. We're so glad that you're a part of this program today and a special program it is going to be. We have Pastor J. Anthony Gilbert in the house. Good to be here, sir and lady. And Sydney Golden. Yeah. Thank you so much, and the spiritual energy that God has in you today, it's going to be exciting. We have a lot of things planned. Now, we're two weeks out from Christmas, and to me, this story is just so unbelievable. But one dimension that I'd like to begin with in our program today is the shepherds watching their flocks by night. And the Bible tells us in, in Luke, it records that they're probably nestled in, and, and as a matter of fact, it was probably in the late summer, early fall of the year, and they would have been nestled in. And then all of a sudden, the sky opens up, a swath goes right through the center of the sky. It's as though it's the noonday sun. They're scared to death. But the angel says, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, you and me. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Praise be to God. That's why we are here. That's what this program is about. That's who we are in the name of this Messiah. Hey Amen. You know what I like what you said, though? You talked about all of the sudden. Mm -hmm. And it says in the scripture that suddenly there appeared unto him. You know, he's the God of the suddenly. That's, right. That's what I love about it. He was the God of the suddenly then. He's the God of the suddenly now. And you need to position yourself for some sudden. <laughs> in your life today. Everybody likes a little sudden in their life, Sydney. Yeah, that's so true. And I love, Tom, how you talk about he's bringing joy to the world. Mm, and I love amen. that, that Jesus is our joy. Yes. And it's because of him we can laugh, we can smile, we can be a light yes. out to the world. So I, I'm so grateful that Jesus is here, that he's with us and he's reigning with us so we can spread that love and joy to you and to everyone in our communities and our family. So yeah, it's great. It surely is. And that's what Christmas is all about, the most joyous time of the year. Thank you, dear. God. And speaking of joy, uh, on our program today, now I, I just have to tell you a little inside scoop here. Uh, many, many years ago, I'm not even sure just exactly how many, one of my great privileges was on the Getting Together program, the original flagship program. I had the opportunity to sing with B.E. Taylor. Okay, now I was background, but oh man, I was singing loud and talking about the joy of the Lord. Man, it was my strength that day. Well, that's significant because they say that fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. Today, we have a very special guest. Yeah, we're so excited that we have his son, B.C. Taylor, that he's here. And we're going to talk about the man, the message, and the music of his father that he left behind, this incredible legacy. So we're really excited to share with you and for you to meet his son. It's going to be great. Amen. I'm real excited because we also have James Gall that's here with us, and he's going to be talking from his book called The Discerner. And it's, we talk about the steps on how to go to the next level in your discernment. You know, discernment is so important that we have that in our lives, and you want to stay tuned for that because it's going to take you to the next dimension. It certainly will. And we also have uh, Dr. Jerry Newcomb, and, and this is his new book, American Amnesia. And I uh, had a wonderful conversation before the program and, uh, just to, to learn a little bit more about how we've forgotten our roots and what we can do, what you and I can do to change that. That's Amen. really good. We know it's so important that we do know where we came from. That's right. Because if you don't know where you came from, you can lose what you have. And sometimes going back helps us to spring forward into what it is that God has for us next. You know, and in America, we've definitely done that. I think it's so important that we get back to our we roots. We take it for definitely. granted. Amen. That's so good. I really agree with that, like getting back to our roots, knowing where we came from, so when we're moving forward and the plans and the purposes that God has for us. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about America amnesia and how we can learn from that and be, you know, the light in our country and our world. This is so very important, and we know in Scripture, we know when God ultimately blessed 
his chosen people to go across the Jordan and then come into the promised land. The very first place that they stopped was Gilgal. And they were instructed that a member of each of the tribes was to take a stone from that dry riverbed and to build it together, to put them together on top of each other as an altar. And it was a way that for future generations, when a grandchild or a great grandchild would say, Granddad, why do we do that? It's because we remember that our God provides. Amen. So, Amen. Well, what's going on in the Holy Land? Our Jerusalem correspondent, Brian Bush, has an update for us right now. Brian, we've heard recently about the attack tunnels from Lebanon's side of the border into Israeli territory. Where are things standing with that right now? The three tunnels that have so far been discovered that were built by Hezbollah forces, uh, they are being examined by the Israeli army so that they can glean whatever information they can from them. And of course, the Israelis are also looking to the UN for their support because Israel would like to finish bo uh, a border wall that they started a few years back on the Lebanese border. They also want the United Nations support in more in border patrols, an increase in the amount of activity of the international community along the border. Tom? What has been Hezbollah's response to Israel's actions? Nothing much really because Hezbollah knows that if they get tangled up with Israel uh, in firefights, uh, they know that Israel will strike them hard and there's no telling where that'll stop. And the only person that that will benefit is Israel's Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu because recently he's been down in the polls but since this operation got underway a few days ago, he has seen a rise in his popularity domestically. Tom? Now, in this border area of northern Israel and southern Lebanon, are there Christians potentially in harm's way? Yes, indeed. Uh, there are a few in that area. You have on the Lebanese side, the Lebanese Maronite Christians, who are mostly farmers in that area. And then, of course, on the Israeli side, the northern part of the border, you have the uh, Palestinian Christians, although few in number, there are some there. And this reminds me of the opening verse of Psalm 27, uh, which says that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Comforting words for Christians anywhere who are caught in trouble, especially here in the Middle East where things can get out of hand so quickly. Reporting for Real Life from Jerusalem, I'm Brian Bush. I really appreciate what Brian was sharing about Hezbollah and just what's going on in Israel. And when we were watching that, it just something that God dropped in my spirit is that he's the Lord of the armies, right? Yes. That, you know, he is our light and our salvation. So whom shall we fear? So even though these things and these circumstances are happening in our world, I have to, you have to hold on to the fact that he's the Lord of the armies, that he's protecting us, that Jesus is going to be on his chariot and riding through. So all we have to do is just stop and just pray and just trust in God and know that he's going to rule and reign. And he has complete and total control of what's happening in our world. That's right. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him and He will give you direction and crown you with success. That's right. You know, and even the adversary has a plan to dig tunnels to try to get to where you are. God has a plan to take you over. So right now we're just going to pray. And we're going to believe God for protection over their lives and protection over your life as well. The Bible says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're going to pray over Israel that God would send them peace. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you right now, Father, for the supernatural peace of God coming round about them, Father God, all of Israel, Father God, and even over Jerusalem, Father God. We pray that every fort and plan and plot of the enemy would come to nothing in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you that only your plans will prevail. And even as Sydney mentioned that, Lord, your armies are going forth, Father, on behalf of your people. They're going on behalf of Israel, Father, and only your plans will prevail. And Father, even now, we break up the spirit of fear. We bind it in the name of Jesus, and we release power, love, and a sound mind to every person declaring no weapon that is formed against them shall prosper. But Lord, they will have victory today. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus. Amen. 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 
Fear not, fear, fear not. not, we are overcomers. Yes, Praise sir. be to God. Well, we'll be right back with a, a wonderful conversation with author Dr. Jerry Newcomb and his new book, American Amnesia. You stay tuned to Real Life. Now more than ever, it's important to stay connected. Here at Cornerstone, we want you to be in the loop. Call now for Real Life Today, the free newsletter that will keep you up to date on all of our programs and specials. It has encouraging articles and behind the scenes stories. Real Life Today, the little newsletter that packs a giant punch. Call now. So we know that in 2019, it is not going to be the same. It's not going to be like 2018. We're going to new levels. Amen. Our nation was founded on biblical principles and history. But our next guest says it seems that our nation is suffering from American amnesia. Dr. Jerry Newcomb is an author and historian who champions recognizing God as the source of our liberty. Jerry, welcome to Real Life. Thank you, Tom. Great to be with you. So nice to have you on the program. Now, uh, an interesting title for your new book, American Amnesia. What's the significance of that title? What does that mean? Well, it means that we have forgotten God and God is the source of our rights. In fact, our birth certificate as a nation is the Declaration of Independence, which mentions God four times and says that our rights come from the Creator. And therefore, what the Creator grants us, it is not up to the state to be able to encroach on or take away. And unfortunately, what's happening is as we have forgotten God and we keep moving away from God as a nation and as a culture, we're starting to lose our freedoms. And especially Christians, uh, I think this is really important because we were basically founded as a nation by Christian nonconformists who were fleeing persecution in the old world that created this new world and gave freedom initially for Christians and then for everybody else. And now, as Bill Federer says, now the last ones in the boat want to kick the first ones out, you know. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. it yeah. Why is it so important for us to have this biblical worldview and not the worldview of just the, the, the culture? Because of the freedom uh, issue and that the fact that the gospel needs to go forth. And I realize, of course, under persecution, the gospel can go forth and so forth. But, but America was founded with this, this Christian roots. I mean, for example, when the pilgrims first came over, and they weren't the very first of the British North American settlements, Jamestown was. Right. Because of Jamestown, and the permanency of that, the pilgrims who were no explorers, they just wanted to worship Jesus Christ and the purity of the gospel as separatists. So essentially they were a subsection of the Puritans, if you will. So the pilgrims, they get blown off course and they had some hired hands on hand who were sympathetic with their cause, but since they were no under no government's jurisdiction, 500 miles north of where they should have been, the separatists were talking about the possibility of striking out on their own, which would have been disastrous for the pilgrims. So they punted and they did something unique in world history. Before a single foot set foot on American soil, the pilgrims wrote up an agreement for self-government, a Christian establishment of self-government. It's called the Mayflower Compact. The Mayflower Compact. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, having undertaken a voyage for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, do covenant and combine ourselves into a civil body politic. Now, I've just compressed some of those words without the dot, dot, dots. But bottom line is they create this, this uh, agreement for self-government written down. They, the men sign it. And then soon after the Puritans start to come because, because they wanted to stay in England, work for the purity of the church, but 
but Charles the first and before him King the King James the first made things so difficult for him forget it it's, this is not working out and eventually they even had a civil war but that's another story right. all right so all these Puritans thousands of them come John Winthrop being the key leader in 1630 he's the one who said that and Ronald Reagan loved this quote we shall be as a city on a hill the eyes of all the world shall be upon us and so the Puritans come they also create agreements for self-government, biblical type covenants. That's the key. And this Mayflower Compact was the first of many biblical type covenants paving the way so you go from we whose names are underwritten in the Mayflower Compact 1620 eventually to the, the Declaration of Independence and then also the Constitution, we the people. We whose names are underwritten eventually morphs into we the people. And Dr. Donald Lutz of uh, the University of Houston is an expert I've interviewed on, on this. And he said, boy, everybody should know about this, this link between the Bible, the biblical covenants, and the American Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence on which the Constitution is predicated. Where did we get away from that? What, what, what do you feel are the cultural um, uh, cultural reasons why we've gotten away from this and, and have developed this amnesia that we we forget the basic fundamentals upon which our nation was founded. Well, to use a phrase from uh, Bob Dylan, it was a slow train of coming. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was. Uh, I think the acceptance of evolution, uh, in, in especially among the intelligentsia in the, in the late 1800s, that started the process. It was the Puritans who founded Harvard. You know, they landed in 1630. That's, right. That's where the main settlement came, 1630. 1636, they already started a college so they could train ministers of the gospel. That's right. When the present ones lie in the dust, it was named Harvard. And so anyway, but in the 1800s, late 1800s, they started to go very liberal. Then the judges and courts, especially in the early 1900s, started to go liberal as far as some of the jurisprudence. So instead of looking at the original tent of the founding fathers and what the Constitution actually says, then all of a sudden, well, we'll just go by judicial precedence. So today, in your average law uh, school, they might not even learn about the U.S. Constitution. They might not even study the Constitution. There are many law schools where they don't even study it. They'll just study Supreme Court decisions. Right. But a lot of times those decisions are based on precedents which are based on uh, things that really don't fit with our history. So all of a sudden when the Founding Fathers, they wrote in 1789 or 19, 1790 when they wrote the, um, the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. 1791, it was accepted. That's our First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Well, in the 1940s, that gets interpreted to mean, oh, there should be this strict wall of separation of church and state. That was in the late 40s, said the Supreme Court. By the way, they were following an obscure letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to you know, uh, some group. Jefferson wasn't even there when they wrote the Constitution, and Jefferson wasn't there when they wrote the, the Bill of Rights. But the Supreme Court, in their infinite wisdom, they, they accepted that. And then later, then it was just a matter of the Supreme Court just throwing out this, throwing out that. They threw out school prayer. They threw out the Ten Commandments in the, uh, you know, posted in the, in the schoolroom. They even said in that decision, 1980, Stone v. Graham, they said, if the Ten Commandments are posted on the walls in the schools, the children might read them, meditate on them, venerate them, and obey them. Imagine that, you know, thou shalt not kill. You know, in, the, in 1980, they said, no, nope, the, spring, the uh, Ten Commandments are not allowed in the schools. And so, you know, we ended up with a situation where basically God is not allowed in the public schools. And as I point out in the book, the public schools ultimately began so that the children could be able to read the Bible for themselves. So uh, we are definitely suffering from American amnesia. Jerry, one of the great blessings that God brought into my life as I served on a local uh, public school board for a quarter, almost a quarter of a century. Oh, wow. And uh, I started in 1991. And, and in that first or second year, uh, we had to deal with a constitutional issue. We had several preacher's kids Yes. that would be graduating, would be speaking at commencement. And our solicitor warned us that uh, in, a, in a case, uh, a Supreme Court ruling in the state of New York, that there was no longer allowed to be a, a sanctioned prayer 
at commencement. I knew that that was not the time when they first announced that to, to make, draw the battle lines. But several days before graduation, I went to bat for three of the, the speakers who were preacher's kids from local churches. And God blessed us. We were the only school in this region, in the wow. Philadelphia uh, region, yes. to have prayer at our commencement. And it, was, it came down to a vote, and all leading up to that point, I was the only, only one going to go with the kids. But that night, God laid on my heart to have a call for a roll call vote and have everyone stand for these kids. The kids came and they said, we want to pray. Yeah. How can you, and, and by the way, it was 9-0. Yeah. They said, we're going to do this thing. When the kids got up and everyone said, we're going to do this. And God bless you. How can we encourage the viewer to make that difference? By each person in every little piece of turf where God has placed you, be faithful with your piece of turf, mm. if you will. Just exactly what you did. If more active Christians uh, were to just be faithful to the Lord. One of my favorite quotes and it, it comes from John Quincy Adams, duty is ours, results are God's. It took a long time to get us down <laughs> oh, to like this that. mess, and it's going to take us a long time, or, you know, actually God could turn things around just like that. What we really need in America is a great revival. But by you being faithful and you being the salt and light in that context, and by the way, I think the law is really, truly on your side. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. see this... Uh, where, in a sense, these, these principals and, and superintendents and the lawyers for schools, they will out ACLU the ACLU, if you will. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> a, they'll throw things out, you know, uh, you know, if it has something to do with religion, forget it. Hey, religion gave birth to this right. nation and gave birth to the schools, so right. we shouldn't forget it. Paul wrote to the church in Rome and he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Amen. So it goes on ahead of us. Well, thank you so very much. And just a powerful, powerful word that you share and encouragement. And we just say thank you, Jerry, and wish you the very, very best in this, in this new book. Thank well, you. we have some good news coming up from Sydney. So you stay tuned to more of Real Life. Former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee says America is betraying its principles by not helping a Pakistani Christian mother. Huckabee wrote a letter to President Trump urging him to offer Asia Bibi and her family asylum. Bibi made headlines after Pakistan's Supreme Court acquitted her of blasphemy charges. She spent eight years on death row, and her release from prison sparked protests. Huckabee says the United States would be the safest place of refuge for Bibi, and the country, our country, has a commitment to religious freedom and tolerance. Chris Pratt read the Christmas story from the Gospel of Luke at Disneyland's Candlelight Ceremony in Anaheim, California. The actor was part of the theme park's annual celebration that began back in 1995. Pratt shared with the crowd that parents should love their children, and the more that they do, they'll understand the Heavenly Father's love for us. Pratt also told the audience they should learn how to pray because it's really good for the soul. That's all for God in the Headlines. Have a great day on Purpose. Yeah, I really love that story. I've been following about Asia Bibi and what's happening in Pakistan. You know, when she was released from prison, there's a lot of protests and there are a lot of things going on. But I know it connects to the interview you just had with Jerry about American amnesia. And what Mike Huckabee was just trying to say is, like, we're forgetting that this country has been founded to allow people that have been persecuted because of their That's faith right. come here. So I think it's just really important to continue to lift up in prayer. And I'm believing that their door is going to open and that Asia is going to be able to come into our country and to live free as a Christian woman. So we definitely keep her in prayer. Mm. That's why it's so important that we get back to those biblical values. That's right. Uh, whenever you don't, whenever you don't know the value of something, abuse is inevitable. I'm going to say that again. Whenever you don't know the value of something, abuse word. is inevitable. So if we don't understand the value of our freedom as Americans, we can lose that freedom. And the purpose of that freedom that we have is so then we could preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and for people to come in to have free expression of religion. In, in the Gospel of Luke, it says it this way. It says, to he who much is given, much is required. That's right. You know, it is an honor. It is a privilege to be Christian Americans, but it is also a responsibility. And Amen. we have to be very, very careful. Amen. Jay, would you lead us in, yes, in prayer, yes, please? Yes, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today. And Father, we pray for those that have been uh, ostracized, that have been persecuted because of their faith, that Lord, we as Americans would remember where we have fallen from. 
Father God, I'm asking today that you would revive us and that we would have a revival, Father God, in America and that we would remember that you are the reason that we have the freedom that we have and that we would use it for your honor and for your glory. So Lord, may America continually be a beacon of light that the gospel might go out from us, Father God, and that people might see you as Lord and Savior, that we might see a revival of souls, that we might see a great awakening and a revival happen, Father God, that Lord, you might come quickly and that you might receive your bride and take us home. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take us home. I was really just feeling in my spirit real quick that I feel like there's somebody like watching right now. If you're watching, you've been persecuted, that you feel ostracized. We want you to call our prayer line at 888-665-4483. We have prayer partners right now standing by that want to stand with you. Yes. They want to agree with you and they want to pray with you. Whatever hurt, whatever persecution that you're going through. I just really sense that somebody's Amen. watching and feels that right now. Well, I believe that uh, this is going to be a very special segment coming up. B.C. Taylor. You're going to want to stay tuned. Stay tuned right here to more of Real Life. Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw me, Lord. And I Well, you know, it really isn't Christmas in Pittsburgh until you hear B.E. Taylor's renditions of Christmas songs. But sadly for us, B.E. Taylor has gone home to be with Jesus, but his son is carrying on his tradition. B.C. Taylor, welcome so much to Real Life. We're Thank so happy to have you. Thank you for having me. And we know that, you know, your dad played an integral role here at Cornerstone with light music, and you have some memories connected to this place. Yes, uh, the, the earliest one I was four, and he was the music director for light music. And uh, I'm a drummer, uh, but at four, I'm, you know, I just like drums. And so he brings, on, brings me on, he goes, you're gonna drum for dad, you're gonna drum for daddy. And I'm like, yeah, and he gives me my drumsticks and, and uh, they, plot, they, you know, they put me down here and all these cameras are, are facing me and it turns red and I just <laughs> freeze. And so I, obviously they panned immediately away from me and went to somebody else. Um, uh, which is hilarious now looking back considering that I've been a professional musician <laughs> for my entire life. Uh, but it started with me getting camera shy um, uh, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, you know, it's really great to see what God has done in your life and uh, we are talking about the man, the mm -hmm. message, and the music yeah. and just how your father's made such a valuable impact upon your life. What were the closing hours like between you and your father? What was your relationship like with him up until that point? My relationship with my father was incredible. I, I mean, he was, he was such a generous and caring father, and, and he, led, he led the family with reason and love, which, which I can only assume it comes from, like, the peace of, of, of being a believer and knowing yeah. where you're going to go and... and, and regardless of what you go through he's always there for you and and even more so once he was diagnosed with uh, with his uh, brain tumor um, he he lived an entire decade fighting cancer and I believe that it's because of it's because of his his relationship with God his unbelievable positivity through just to life in general and uh, my my mother's undying search for for uh, uh, an alternative um, uh, treatment. treatment mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, but even through all of that, he and I had a relationship where we would talk on the phone 
literally every day for hours to a point where I was late to multiple sessions and, and, and just events because he was on the phone telling me one last story, I'd like to get it, you know, just to wrap it up. Um, and, and, and that's that's sort of how our last conversation went. I, uh, I had a show in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, it's so, so rare that a show actually starts early, earlier than, than announced, and this particular show was that. It was moved up, and so therefore I was back at the hotel earlier, um, which then meant uh, I was back in my hotel room earlier, and I, you know, I, and I don't, I, we were talking about this earlier, there is, there is no coincidence there. I could have gone out, I could have hung with the, the band, I could have called anybody else, uh, but I called my family, and uh, mom and dad picked up, and we had this two and a half hour conversation covering every topic uh, father and son would want to talk about. And we, we, you know, we laughed, we were telling stories, we were joking, and it, and it ended with us saying that we love each other. And, uh, and then I got the call a few hours later that he, he had passed. Uh, and obviously it's, I mean, that, that call, no one ever wants to get that call, but here we are three years later, um, and I'm so unbelievably grateful for that, for that conversation because it really was a condensed version of our entire our, our entire relationship yeah you know your dad it's, it's so amazing like what you were sharing that he really taught you you know like you saw him on stage but in the home it was the same person it was the same man to teach you to become the man that you are yeah. today yeah he uh, I mean he he would be the first to and he, he's joked about it we were joking backstage there was very little difference between B.E. Taylor and Bill Taylor and the probably the most discernible was the clothing and and the reason I say that is when he's on stage he's clean look like you very nicely put together sharp suit you know hair all done when he's home he's wearing his aliquippa sweatpants <laughs> and his pit jersey and you know, he, he always had two pairs of glasses because he couldn't mm -hmm. see like, he just and and uh, you know and he he would be the first to say I'd go on stage looking like that because that's where that's how I'm comfortable and thank goodness for my mother who didn't allow that to happen ever but no I mean it's very much that's that's so true where the way he was on stage was the way he was at home and and none of it was an act like he that's he awesome. he truly he truly did care that much on and off stage about everybody that's yeah. awesome that's so good well you know here at Cornerstone we have the honor of having B.E. perform one of his most famous Christmas songs here at our studios here's B.E. with Rick Wachowski singing Mary's Boy Child Long time ago in Bethlehem, Holy Bible sang Mary's born child, Jesus Christ was born on Christmas Day. Hark now, hear the angels sing, newborn king today, man shall live forevermore, because of Christmas Day. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, see a bright shining star. In rock choir singing, music come from afar. Joseph and his wife Mary came to Bethlehem that night. Find a place to bear a child, not a single place was inside, they sing. Hark now, hear the angels sing, new born king today. Man shall live forevermore Because of Christmas Day A trumpet sound the angels sing Listen to what they say Man shall live here Because of Christmas Day Christmas Day What do you want to say, B.E. Taylor? I want to say Mary, 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 Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Here we go. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, yeah. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, yeah.
man, that's phenomenal. awesome, man. You know, I have to be honest, I never had a chance to meet your dad, but mm -hmm. looking at you and seeing the man you've become and knowing how his life impacted yours is just astounding. And I know you're very proud of your father's oh, yeah. accomplishments. And we want to talk about the legacy that he had the, and the message in the music. We talked about the man, but what was the message behind his music that he wanted to portray? Love. Uh, there, I mean, if I could sum it up with one word, it's love. And, and, and if you were to listen to his entire catalog, it, it's just such a reoccurring theme. Love yourself, love one another. You know, Love Won the Fight is one of his songs. Without love, you've got nothing at all. It's another one. Um, Vitamin L, probably his biggest one, Vitamin Love. You know, and, it, and it's, he, he would sing about what he knows and, that, and what he believes in, and, and especially once he, once he became a believer and, and once his faith became what it was. Um, it, was it was the love of family, friends, his Lord, uh, and, and, and that, that touched so many people because it was so positive. You know, and it was it was music with a message that that you know it's okay to be sad. You know, that he has it, it, he he. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be lost. But if, as long as you trust and that you love and, and you you know it, everything's going to work out. And yeah. you know you're going to work it out. Is another one of the songs, and it's all about it's okay to cry. But if you feel if you feel like dying, you got to pick yourself up because you're going to work it out because of God. You know, yeah. and and and. He, again, he just he would sing and, and write songs because he believed what he was what he was saying. Amen. Yeah. I really love how you talk about his message was love, and there's yeah. a legacy of love that you're bringing into the city of Pittsburgh, Absolutely. a special concert to honor your father. Can you tell us about that? Sure. I, uh, we've been doing this show. Uh, it started in the early 90s, and it grew from one show to two to five to ten to towards the end. It was it was between 18 to 15 shows throughout the month of December, and. Uh, it, it became my Christmas tradition, and it became thousands of others, uh, their Christmas uh, um, tradition, to the point where children would come to the show, and then fast forward 15 years, and now they're bringing their children to the show. And, you know, the fact that, that he was so generous and, and, and um, uh, humble on stage to, to have no, no ego to, you know, he would share the, the spotlight with everybody on, on, on that stage, so much so that we're able to do these shows without him because he's still such a part of the show and everybody in the audience watched me grow up and watched the interactions with Rick, who you just saw on screen, and everybody else on stage. So there's a relationship that we have with the audience and vice versa to where these shows that we're doing this year it's a celebration of the man that w we love so much and the message of the birth of Christ. And, and, and that's the goal. Dad wrote a song called Feel the Love of Christmas. And it's all about feeling the love of Christmas all year round. And our job and what we're hoping to do with these shows is to spread that this year in, in honor of him. Yeah. Where can we get the info for the shows if we want to go? Uh, there's a site, www.celebratebe.com. It has all the information and all the contact, uh, any, anything you would need to, it's got all four locations and all the information that you would need for those locations on that website. Yeah. Amen. Well, thank you so much for oh. coming out and sharing your wonderful story with us. Uh, it's so glad to be able to get a chance to meet you. And you can also go to our webpage at ctvn.org, and that'll also give you some information. And Tom's got a special message for us. Let's go see what Tom has to say. We're so glad that you're a part of this wonderful, wonderful program, and we're receiving a lot of calls, and if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we ask that you make him your Lord now. Our wonderfully anointed team here, they would love to hear from you, love to pray with you, love to tell you about the King that we serve. How about it? I pretty much grew up in the church, but it wasn't until I was 20 years of age that I actually understood that it wasn't anything that I was doing, but it was what God had already done for me. It was a relationship. Matter of fact, it was, of all people, it was Jesus' people that shared this message, other teenagers like myself, that shared this message of hope. And the one scripture that was just absolutely undeniable to me, I couldn't transliterate it, I couldn't misunderstand it, 
was Paul's letter to the church in Ephesians. And he said to them, he said, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, I want to tell you, as you're thinking at this Christmas time now and still two weeks out from Christmas Day, you're thinking about gifts. There is no greater gift than the gift that God has given to you and to me in His Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth, may you believe. And if you don't understand that, please call one of our prayer partners and, and, and make sure that you know that God has given you and me a very precious gift of eternal life. Please continue to pray. Please allow our prayer partners to prayer with you. And now we have a, a, a wonderful interview uh, with James Gall teaching about the keys to developing spiritual discernment. Well, we're back here with James Gall discussing his book, The Discerner, and you're going to discuss today how to unlock the next level. Yeah, I think that sounds exciting. Would you like an upgrade? I would love an upgrade. Give me some keys to that next level. Let's see if we can do that. So how many of you out there right now, you would like to grow and increase? In our first segment, we talked about that for the mature, that they have practiced their senses to discern good and evil. Let's build on that now, and let's look at some keys on how to get an upgrade or go to the next level. Well, I have a theme verse for this segment as well. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, where it reads, He humbled you. Oh, my goodness. I don't know if we need to read that anymore or not, and <laughs> that's not a very popular part. And we overlooked that part of the verse, but it's in there. He humbled you, now listen to this, and he yes. let you be hungry. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, folks. Now I know I'm not reading the whole verse yet, but this is full of revelation. One of the best things that God can do for you is let you be hungry. Wow. Did you hear me? One of the best things the Holy Spirit can do is help create, cultivate, an amazing hunger within you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're the ones who are going to be filled. So back to the theme verse of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. He humbled you and he let you be hungry. Now, the next part is also equally amazing. He doesn't just leave you at a frustrated place where you're hungry and he doesn't do anything about it. He humbled you. He let you be hungry, and now it says, and he fed you with manna, daily bread. And he fed you with manna, now look at this, which you did not know. Huh. And look at this, nor did your fathers know. Does that mean that there are things that are reserved for us in the here and now that maybe we learned from the generations before, but there's progressive revelation because wow. God wants, there's things that are reserved for you, for me, for us, things reserved in every generation. Okay, he humbled you. He let you be hungry. He fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you to understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything. Say the word everything with me right now. Everything. Man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That is just absolutely incredible. Now, in this verse in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 I find four key components humility hunger number two being fed and number four understanding and revelation because it says it says he humbled you key number one is humility and then it says and he let you be hungry so humility God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble, right? Hey, folks, that's said three times in the Bible. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. So key number one is humility. There you receive grace. Key number two is hunger. He lets you be hungry. And hunger, see, hunger 
I mean, the, those who are not hungry, they don't eat. They don't feed themselves. You got to learn to feed yourself. And it's your hunger that's going to drive you. So humility, hunger, and being fed. God feeds you, but guess what? God has given us this word, and there is daily manna, daily bread in here, and God wants to give you a word every day. And so I want you to get hungry for God and for his word, and he's going to feed you, but I'm just going to give you a realistic, just a simple truth is, here's your food. Here's your bread. And, but it also says this, then four, fourth key is understanding and revelation. One of my mentors taught me this. It's the worst day to be a know-it-all. Did you get that? It's the worst day to be a know-it-all. Now, why? Because God opposes the proud. So humility, hunger, and these other elements that I brought to you, boy, are they ever keys. Listen to this one. The depth of your hunger is the length of your reach to God. Huh? Wait, let me say it again. The depth of your hunger is the length of your reach to God. So we want to humble ourselves. We want to be hungry. And we ask God, illuminate your written word. Feed us from your word. Feed us by your spirit. And, and then teach us things that we've not been taught. Open up to us a school of the word and the school of the spirit. Now, these very words from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3 are then quoted for us in the New Testament by Jesus. And where it reads, But he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In the Greek tense there, it is for that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. It is an ongoing active tense verb. So it isn't once you ate and that's enough. No, it is an, the ever proceeding word. The word of God has come forth. The word comes forth now and the word will come forth in the future. And so God is always at work to feed, his, to feed his children, to feed us. So he invites us to the banqueting table. He puts out a whole spread there for us because it is the ever proceeding word of God. It isn't, this is where some people live, they live only on yesterday's word. It might be called stale bread. Right. God spoke. Well, that's really good. But there's more than only God spoke. God spoke, God speaks, and God will speak again. Now, reviewing of the senses, our eyes, seeing visions. How about increasing in dreams? Our ears, to hear supernaturally. Maybe it's going to also be voices like a, a voice of an angel. It's in the Bible, folks. Our heart, moving in rhythm with God's heart feeling the emotions of God. Or how about in the gifts of the Spirit, that anointing coming upon our heart, and we begin to discern what's going in the life of that waitress that is, is, is serving us. And you might get a word of knowledge, and you might feel something, or you might get a promise of something good that God wants to do. So, our eyes, I see, ears, hearing, and heart feeling, tongue tasting, again, both good and bad. Because you can taste, and you go, something just doesn't taste right. Or in smell, we can also go, not only the aromas of, the, of, of God, but how about this? Well, have you ever gone like, huh, hmm, wow, hmm. It's like a, something just doesn't smell right here. And so as we can grow in discerning good and evil in mind, knowing supernatural, supernatural mind of Christ, and there we get divine knowings. Oral Roberts said the gift of faith is I know that I know right. that I know. 
Well, you too can have divine knowings and you can have these four components of humility, hunger, getting fed, and moving in new levels of understanding and revelation. An invitation to the next level into the ways of God. I say God has the original WWW. That's right. The will, the word, and the ways Amen. of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, according to your word, yes, God. we have not because we ask not. Therefore, we admit our need and we declare your vast supply. And we ask for your divine thoughts and your divine knowings to be released to each of us. Yes. By the grace of God, yes. we believe right now Hallelujah. that we are receiving an upgrade yes. of the enhancement of revelation on our hearts, on our minds, for Jesus Christ's sake, amen and amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, James. You know, a question I have is, uh, you mentioned humility and hunger. Are those the doorways to getting into the next level? Because, you know, a lot of time we think, well, we should be full. We're going to get with God on the mountaintop. But does sometimes he leads us into a place of hungry, hunger yes. and humility in order to get us to that next level? He sure does. And there, you, you, I think you have a revelation on the process. That's a part of the process. These four key words I'm giving, they are part of the process. And then the solution or the remedy that comes by cooperating with the process. So, yes. So, the doorway is always grace. But how do we get grace? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will bring you to the next level. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, James. And next time on our next segment, James is gonna to talk to us more about becoming wise and discerning. You're not gonna to wanna to miss it. Satan's number one weapon is deception, and the church's number one need is discernment. If you'd like a copy of this book, for your best gift, you can receive James, Gull, James Gull's new book, The Discerner. So please call, please write Cornerstone Television so that you can have a copy of this book in your hands. Now, for the longest time, when my wife and I walk, I would say to her, boy, God was speaking to me today. But this summer, God laid on my heart, I'm always speaking to you. And so now I change what I say to Lucy and I say, you know what, I shut up long enough that I could hear God today. <laughs> That's what it means to be still in the presence of Almighty God. Amen. Well, it's important that we do that. You know, he also mentioned something about being hungry, you know, being hungry. And I think, you know, you mentioned something earlier about how in your interview about how we've lost that amnesia. And I think you asked the question, how did we get to that point? That's when right. we start losing our hunger, for the things of God, and they were all passionate to be free. We've been in freedom so long, we've been hungry for Deuteronomy 8, correct? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Deuteronomy 8 talks about when you go to the promised land, you Israelites go to the promised land, and you eat and are full, don't forget me, says the Lord. And I think America, in a sentence, can be summarized by one of the Puritans way back when. He said, religion begat prosperity, and the daughter hath consumed the mother. Wow. We prospered because of Jesus, and now because of our prosperity, we have forgotten Jesus, the source of our liberties. That's right. You know, one thing I really appreciate today with our show is that, like, VC with your dad, and that he stirred up that hunger in you to thirst and yeah. hunger after the things of God. Like, what an incredible legacy and deposit that he gave into you to, like, live out the things of God. Absolutely. I, I you know, I, to, to touch on what you were saying, I, I try every day to pray, whether it's good or bad, because it's so, it's so easy to pray when things are bad, you know, or you're going through something. But man, when things are good, just basically what you were saying, it's so easy to just be like, oh man, it's great, and just keep <laughs> going. But those are the times where you should be thanking, you know, and, 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 still, and still surrounding yourself in his word and, 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 and spending time with him, because good and bad, he's there, like you said, and, right. and, and we need to you know, recognize that. There is such a powerful, God gives it to us as a command, but I've always prayed this with my family, be still mm. 
and know that I am God. And when my boys got older, I would pray that every morning when they would get up, every evening when we would go to, to bed. And uh, when they got older, we used the word know as the root word and made it acknowledge. More than just knowing you, more than just being still, being quiet and, and quieting our hearts, dear God, may we know you as God to be sure. Mm -hmm. But unlike the demons that were cast into the swine and went over the hill, they knew who Jesus was. Lord, even more than that, may we acknowledge you yeah. for who you are. Yeah. Acknowledge you. Well, I think that's the reason why it's so important that we stay hungry and mm. stay humble, even as the book That's points right. out, because when we lose our hunger and we're no longer full, we have a sense to be puffed up with pride, thinking we don't need to acknowledge it, God anymore. What do you say? Acknowledge me in all your ways and you'll direct our path. He'll That's direct right. our path. You know what's neat though, too, in just reading some of these prayer requests that have been coming in just during the last time, hour or so, uh, you see people that are really hungering and, yeah. and they're needy. That's right. And you know, Dear God, please answer all these prayers, including a poor sister that needs some help with her teeth. Maybe may God res, you know, raise up a Christian dentist to, to provide her needs here. Wouldn't lot, that be great? A lot of physical needs, yes. a lot of financial Healing. needs. Yeah. I, I just want to offer this again and make, make sure that you know you can have a copy of very much what we're talking about here. But James Gall's new book about, about discernment and how the keys to, to learning uh, to be a discerner of the Word of God. And I would like to close our, our program today. And thank you so much for being with us. But I'd like to close this hour in prayer. And Sydney, if you would please lead us. Heavenly gracious Father, we just come to you, Father God, on behalf. We stand in the gap of all the prayer requests that are laid here at your altar, Father God. And God, we send the healing word, yes. Father God, to Clara, Father God, yes. that is for her eye, Father God, and Joyce who needs work, Father God, open up a door for her, Father God. And I pray for family salvation, Father God, that you Thank would just you. come into the hearts of those that are crying out for their families, Father yes. God. Yes. Even the prayer requests, as Jerry said about the woman with her teeth, Father God, you yes. know Thank what's you. on everyone's heart, Father Thank God. God and Holy Spirit, we pray that you would just come into their living rooms. You would come into the hospital room, yes. wherever they are right now, Lord wherever Jesus, and Thank touch you. them, Lord God. Touch them with your love, your healing, and your deliverance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. 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 Well, what a, what a wonderful time of worship we've had. We just had church. <laughs> thank you. And thank you. We're, we're so glad that you were a part of this program today. And, and now just a couple of weeks out from, from Christmas, may you know Jesus as your Savior. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Stone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible. 